Welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is Marie Gertz and I am Professor and Head of the Department of Nursing here at the University of Melbourne in the Melbourne School of Health Sciences. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the University of Melbourne and to this year's Marion Barrett Lecture. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Greater Kulin Nation, and I want to especially recognise their enduring connections to land, water and community. I pay respect to Wurundjeri elders past and present and welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us this evening. A special welcome this evening too to our guest speaker, Dr Madonna Grean, and to the Deputy Head of the Melbourne School of Health Sciences, Professor Alison McKendrick. We also warmly welcome members of the Barrett family, along with our student body, our alumni and our colleagues. In this, the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, I want to especially pay tribute to the work of nurses and midwives and to recognise the incredibly challenging conditions they currently face. Here at the University of Melbourne, we are so proud to be educating the nurses of the future. I want to sincerely thank our partner health services for their continued support of our students while also responding to a global disaster. Your dedication and your commitment to our students is greatly appreciated and we thank you. Now I'd like to call on Professor Alison McKendrick to speak on behalf of the faculty and the Melbourne School of Health Sciences and most importantly to introduce the 2020 Marion Barrett Lecture. Thanks Alison. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, good evening and welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and a real honour to be invited. Uh, the Marion Barrett Lecture is the result of a bequest to the university by Sir James William Barrett in 1945, named for his wife, Lady Barrett. Sir James William Barrett lectured in ophthalmology and the special senses at the University of Melbourne. He was a member of the university's governing council for 45 years and held for some time the position of vice chancellor. Sir James Barrett believed that educated nurses were pivotal to maintaining and restoring good health. In the 1920s, while visiting North America, he became convinced of the merits of tertiary education for nurses and campaigned to create a similar pathway at the University of Melbourne. While he was unsuccessful during his lifetime, he left a sum of £750 toward the founding of a school of nursing, named in honour of his wife, Marion who died in 1939. Marion Barrett was an accomplished artist who studied at the National Gallery School of Fine Art in Melbourne, alongside artists such as Clara Southern, John Longstaff and Arthur Streeton. La Lady Barrett donated many of her works to raise money for good causes, causes including the Victorian Bush Nursing Association. And now to our speaker, Dr. Madonna Grehan is a registered general nurse and midwife, an independent historian, and honorary fellow of the Department of Nursing, Melbourne School of Health Sciences. Dr. Grehan held the CJ Latrobe Society Fellowship at the State Library of Victoria in 2013, and the John Oxley Library Fellowship at the State Library of Queensland in 2015. She is the immediate past president of the Australian and New Zealand Society of the History of Medicine. Her research interests include the history of midwives, nurses, and the healthcare of women in Australia, biography, oral history, women and work, and nurses in World War II. It is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Madonna Grehan to deliver the 2020 Marion Barrett Lecture. Good evening, everyone and thank you for coming. Professor McKendrick, Professor Gertz, distinguished guests, members of the Barrett family, my fellow nurses, midwives and colleagues, it's a great honour for me to be presenting the Marion Barrett Lecture tonight. As you've heard from Marie, 2020 is the WHO designated International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. For nurses and midwives in practice, it's been an exhausting and sobering year. As of mid-September 2020, worldwide, 
More than 1,000 nurses have died after contracting COVID-19 in the course of their nursing work. The health of countless others has been affected. COVID-19 reminds us that being a nurse can be a risky business. As I will convey to you this evening, nursing in infectious diseases has always posed risks. In this brief foray into our professional history, my lecture tonight serves as an act of remembrance to those who have gone before. Hobart's Medal for Meritorious Services in Nursing was awarded to 22 sisters and nurses in August 1887 after a punishing year of providing care to those admitted to Hobart's General Hospital with typhoid. Typhoid was an insidious foe because it was indiscriminate. It attacked people in an age group 15 to 45 years, seemingly in the flush of health. The disease was endemic in Tasmania, the southernmost colony of Australia in 1887. Geographer Roger Kellaway argued that typhoid proliferated owing to a coalescence of climatic and social conditions, persistent dry weather, leading to a lack of fresh water for drinking and cleaning, exacerbated by an increasing population, illegal cesspits, and illegal distribution of human and household waste. Euphemistically referred to in the English speaking world as nuisances, feces, urine and other waste was washed into the streets and drains, sticking to surfaces where people walked and where peat children played. In the 1880s, diseases like typhoid were considered zymotic, producing poisons known as miasmas. Miasmas were, miasmas were understood as morbid vapours derived from unclean circumstances, air, cesspits, sewers, dead rats, cemeteries, and according to one doctor, possibly the menstrual discharge of the nurse. The medical response to a miasmatic world was the application of sanitary science, structurally, operationally, and practically. As historian Karen Dawes has reported, sanitarianism governed how hospitals and those within them functioned. With an emphasis on, protect, on prevention, cleanliness and good ventilation were critical to prevent miasmas from prevailing. In the nursing world, sanitary science's most famous evangelist was Florence Nightingale. For patients, her new view, new vision of nursing was set to replace old ways of work with new and improved ways of practice. A historic version of patient-centred care, if you like. Given Miss Nightingale's remarkable influence throughout the British Empire, Sanitarianism was embedded in nurse training schemes which emerged in the second half of the 19th century. Nursing practice, as some of us know, involved a strict regime of cleaning and airing, using damp cloths to contain dust and dirt, and of course, scrubbing floors. Sanitary science also demanded behaviours and practices from attendants, perfect cleanliness and personal order. When it came to infectious diseases, however, sanitary science was challenged because not all disease could be explained by a lack of cleanliness. At the Women's Hospital in Melbourne, for example, there were periodic appearances of virulent infections termed collectively purpural sepsis in postnatal women. These appeared from nowhere the origins of these conditions were therefore disputed. Some doctors claimed scarlatina the origin and others believed erysipelas to be the problem. And while not a community-wide epidemic per se, within a particular population of patients, these 
infections posed an enormous threat and they were covered by the newspapers intensely. In London, persistence of purple sepsis ended Florence Nightingale's experimental training school for midwives at King's College Hospital after only five years of operation. Likewise, at the Melbourne Women's Hospital, outbreaks of infection in the 1870s and 1880s forced the institution to close for periods, as Janet McCalman has reported. The midwifery patients were housed in the homes of local midwives whose reputations could be vouched for. Intensive cleaning and fumigation proceeded in the wards where infected patients had been nursed. Walls were whitewashed, mattresses were burnt, and nurses were sent out to isolate. As doctors sought to explain these mysterious infections, <coughs> pardon me, attention turned to practitioners themselves, particularly bedside nurses. The women's introduced a raft of rules. Some of these practices have resonance even today. Since its early days, the hospital had operated two distinct departments, a midwifery and an infirmary department, later called the gynaecology department. This geographic separation was based on the fundamental premise that pregnancy was in the most part a state of health, while women in the infirmary department required surgery and were deemed to be ill, as was often the case. The problem was that maternity patients were those affected by purpural sepsis. In response, the women's decided to restrict the movement of staff. Nurses were not permitted to assist the other department if one happened to be busy. This had been a long-standing practice to help each other out. Staff from the different departments were instructed not to mix each other mix with each other, I beg your pardon, after working hours. Meals were taken separately. And when away from the hospital, nurses were instructed not to go near any infectious or contagious cases under pain of dismissal. But as we know from COVID-19, people can be carrying an infection and be asymptomatic. Next, a set of antiseptic rules for the midwifery nurses was printed and distributed. Among the rules, were cleaning of hands and nails. And as you can see from this slide, the latter was done with a knife. Subsequently, the rules were expanded to require that nurses bathed daily between the hours of six and 12 o'clock. Responsibility for overseeing that particular hygiene regime was shared by the resident surgeon and the head nurse of the respective department. Head nurses also controlled who could visit. These various rules left responsibility for preventing infection firmly and literally in the hands of nurses. At one point, the nurse's clothing was implicated in harbouring an infection. Up to the late 1880s, most nurses wore dresses of stuff and an apron which was changed daily. Stuff was tightly woven long fibre wool, sometimes cashmere, strengthened with cotton or silk. Stuff dresses were deemed unsuitable for repeated washing, and so the women's hospital shifted to cotton print fabric, which could handle hot water and repeated exposures to it. More startling is a recommendation on treating uniforms from an 1893 textbook authored by a doctor in Sydney. He recommended that uniforms be infected occasionally with the fumes of burnt sulphur. As you'll appreciate, not only does sulphur have a particularly pungent odour, the fumes from burning it are highly toxic to the airwaves. Airways, I think you pardon. Several hospitals practised isolation of patients with diseases deemed contagious, but again, as Karen Dawes has reported, isolation was applied inconsistently across hospitals, with some places managing typhoid, measles, diphtheria and tuberculosis in general wards, along with other conditions. At the women's in the 1880s, when infections became more frequent, 
midwifery patients affected by sepsis were excluded from admission. If a patient already in the hospital became affected, she was housed in an isolation cottage behind the hospital. As you'll appreciate, those in this slide are a little bit later than I'm talking about in the 1880s. The cases of infection strained the hospital staff considerably in number and in health because they required an intensive nursing care. Best practice for unwell patients at the women's was taken to mean consistency in personnel. That is, a competent and special nurse was appointed to infectious cases and instructed how to manage them. The special nurse was responsible for a single case because the rules on antisepsis precluded the resident medical officers from attending these patients, given that they had to care for all of the other healthy patients in the hospital. The special nurse was thus isolated with that patient until the patient recovered or died. For a nurse, this could mean weeks on continuous duty, up to 17 hours a day. And unsurprisingly, it sometimes ended with the nurse being admitted to hospital or a convalescent home. These were indeed difficult conditions. Men in colonial Victoria had achieved an eight hour working day in 1856, yet nurses in 1888 worked at least 12 hours a day on average, six days a week. Most nurses at the women's hospital had to pay for their pupillage. If a nurse became sick during that time, she was not entitled to compensation, nor was she paid if she took a holiday. If the holiday was for two months on the recommendation of medical advice, there was no guarantee that the nurse's position would be kept for her. Unsurprisingly, it was not uncommon for nurses to resign simply because they were ill. A perennial shortage of nurses exacerbated the degree of difficulty with infection cases at the women's. Charitable institutions tended to employ few trained nurses because they commanded a higher wage. Hospitals tended to have a skeleton of trained staff and they relied on a constant throughput of new pupils. In this sense, infection cases imposed particular stresses. These were complex, um, complex cases and unwell women. They needed experienced nurses to attend them but using an experienced nurse for one infection only, possibly for weeks, took this senior nurse away from the supervision of the wards and the teaching of novice pupils. By the late 1880s, it was possible to hire special nurses via one of the nurses bureau in such as the East Melbourne Home for Nurses. And of course, just as it does today, employing agency nurses came at a cost. What engaging a special nurse from a bureau did was monetize the cost of employing a single nurse for a single patient for a period of duty. To the women's hospital management, it was an unwelcome revelation to learn that trained nurses came at a cost. The hospital was a charitable institution which relied on donations and small government grants. Sometimes when the women's received a bill for hiring a special nurse, they simply returned the invoice and asked for a reduction in the fee. Importantly, however, amid these challenges, the women's hospital took the teaching of pupils seriously. Antisepsis was considered fundamental to midwifery practice and embedded in the teaching of its pupil nurses. After that training, that knowledge was applied in communities where these women worked. It's unsurprising that this institution was, was nationally famous for its safe care of women and for its careful teaching of pupils. In the Southern colony of Tasmania, Nurses were also the linchpin of care provision in Hobart's government hospital. In 1887, 
measles, smallpox and typhoid were all prevalent. Smallpox was feared. Yet there were greater numbers of typhoid cases and greater number of numbers of deaths from typhoid. Dawes has reported that people with smallpox were generally moved to isolation and it's unsurprising when we're reminded of what it looks like in this picture. Typhoid, meanwhile, was treated in hospitals and homes without the understanding that it was highly infectious and exceedingly dangerous to health. For those managing typhoid at home, a nurse ordered a useful advice book. The author, Frances Gillam Holden, had trained at the Sydney Hospital. Later, she worked at Hobart Hospital, where she contracted typhoid and was invalided to Melbourne to recover on a salary. Informed by her personal experience, Holden's advice book offers surprising insights into what this trained nurse thought good nursing involved for these cases. What Typhoid Is and How to Nurse It was originally published as a pamphlet in 1882 with a subtitle of Words of Cheer for Women, showing how much is in their power. This directly connected recovery with careful attendance on the patient, even for those who were not trained as nurses. Given her background training as a nurse, Holden's text reflects a sanitary science approach to fever nursing. And some of her recommendations bear remarkable similarities to Victoria's Department of Health advice for managing COVID-19 cases at home today. Holden recommended thorough cleaning of eating utensils, strict limits on visitors, perfect cleanliness of the room, the person, and their linen, frequent changes of bed clothes and airing of blankets, along with plenty of fresh air day and night without drafts. In hospitals, the primary form of medicine for typhoid that was prescribed by doctors was stimulants. For those at Hobart Hospital, for example, patients had a daily allowance of stimulant beverages. These were 350 mils of brandy and a bottle of champagne, supplemented with wine, ale, stout and cordials if the doctor ordered them. Recognising that liquid nourishment was critical to patient delivery, Frances Holden did not recommend alcohol. She recommended good beef tea, mutton broth, chicken broth or milk, about two litres in 24 hours. And these were to be given at regular intervals with weak acid drinks and ice to suck in between times. Holden advised cleaning of the patient's mouth too, several times a day. To do this, the nurse made a virtual mop using a small paintbrush with strips of lint tied to the end of it and dipped in water. Holden advised that every nurse ought to have a watch or clock and a slate or pen and paper. These were necessary to accurately record what procedures took place when and if there were changes in signs and symptoms. For those nursing at home, a pharmaceutical syrup of boiled lemons could be made. This involved juicing 10 lemons and boiling the skins for 20 minutes. The boiled mixture was left for six hours, strained and then added to the juice with one half an ounce of citric acid, 200 grams of salicylic acid with white sugar and water to taste. The syrup could then be diluted with water. As you can see on this slide, Warner's Safe Cure was available from chemists too. Both of these, the syrup and Warner Safe Cure, had salicylates. So this may have reduced fever and pain in typhoid patients. But as to the effect of anti-typhoid brand tobacco, 
I can only, eventu only venture to imagine the effect that that may have had. Fever was one of the most difficult things to manage in typhoid patients. Hydrographic treatment was common to lower a patient's temperature. It came in two forms, packing and compressing. These tasks were labour intensive, physically demanding and very messy practices for nurses. Packing was a cooling poultice. It needed two or three nurses. Firstly, the patient was moved to a bed or a sofa. Frances Holden in her advice book warned that sudden movement could be seriously injurious to a patient. It could rupture pyres patches, the sections of bowel that were grossly inflamed in kyphoid cases. She recommended steady and quiet lifting of the patient. The nurses only had to imagine that the person they were carrying was a dish full of liquid diamonds. Once this precious cargo was removed to a sofa, a nurse placed several blankets in layers on the bed. On top of the blankets, she placed a sheet which had been drenched in cold water. The nurses returned the patient to the bed, placed him on the wet sheet and wrapped him in it. Then they folded the layers of blankets around the sheet. Depending on the degree of fever, every 10 to 15 minutes, the nurses undid the entire bundle, replaced the wet sheet and rewrapped the patient in the swaddling blankets. This process continued for an hour. An alternative was a smaller cold compress, just like a cold pack we would use today, but out of cloth. If the temperature did not drop, the patient was put in a tepid bath. In hot climates, such as in Queensland, some doctors advised immersion in water at around 23 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. In the daytime, these cold baths were repeated three hourly if pyrexia persisted and at night, cold sponging was recommended. But thinking of the nurse or the nurses in this case, each time the patient had to be lifted. The patient had to be supported in the bath. The patient had to be removed. The patient had to be dried and returned to bed. In cases nursed at home, Tasmania's Board of Health recommended that all excreta should be disinfected without explaining what solution to use. In Victoria, helpfully, the Board of Public Health advised corrosive sublimate for disinfection. The board acknowledged that the substance was dangerous and perhaps unsuited to use in private homes. Instead, they recommended the burning of excreta, which I'm still having trouble working out how one would actually do in cases of typhoid and other diarrheal diseases. Care of the skin was another key in Holden's good nursing advice. Changing bed linen and washing the patient was done as often as necessary if the patient was incontinent or sweating profusely. Carbolic solution in a tub of water was used for disinfecting soil linen. It was then thoroughly cleaned, washed and exposed to fresh air and sunlight. We can see the level of work that typhoid generated from the laundry reports of Hobart's General Hospital. During the month of April, 1887 alone, when the hospital had 68 inpatients with typhoid, the laundry washed and dried 1,147 1, bed sheets, 1,002 draw sheets, 540 shirts and 770 nightgowns. These figures do not include towels, compresses, bandages, dressings, nurses' aprons and other items also processed by the laundry. Delirium induced by pyrexia was another feature of advanced typhoid. 
delirious patients sometimes threatened to harm themselves and it was usual practice to restrain the individual. Cotton wool was, play, was laid over the ankles and calico bands were fixed around them and firmly attached to the bottom of the bed to secure the feet. The upper part of the body was held down by a bed sheet, extending from the throat to the knees and fastened to each side of the bed, probably with safety pins. But there are examples where younger patients who were fit and strong, quite aside from their typhoid symptoms, could break these bonds even though they were delirious and they too at least escaped the Hobart Hospital and walked along the hospital's wall to find a place to jump into the street. A last resort for pyrectic patients who were delirious was the isolation room with mattresses padding the walls and floor. When a patient was confined this way, a nurse had to check on him every 30 minutes. In 1887 at Hobart Hospital, isolation was used only twice. For nurses, caring for typhoid patients was indeed heavy work. Many of the typhoid patients were extremely ill, admitted to hospital moribund, having had symptoms for three or four weeks. For the typhoid patients, 14 nurses covered the day and night shifts. Six days a week, they were on duty from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., but often until 9 p.m. when there were fewer nurses available. They had 45 minutes for dinner and 30 minutes for lunch, provided there were no interruptions. This left another eight nurses to manage the rest of the hospital's work. Nurses were indeed the linchpin of care provision at Hobart General. But on several occasions, the hospital had to operate at half of its usual staff complement because so many of the nurses were ill with typhoid and trained nurses could not be obtained. They often used half recovered patients to supervise others. It is telling that in advertisements for new probationers during the 1887 epidemic, Hobart's lady superintendent sought applications from, and I quote, earnest, educated girls with good health and free from fear, end quote. A lack of fear was probably very necessary because Hobart General Hospital had earned a reputation. It was known colloquially, colloquially as the headquarters of death. In 1887, 39 patients died from typhoid at, at Hobart Hospital. Inevitably, the value of every practice in every circumstance was debated vehemently by doctors and other commentators in the newspapers, as were the origins of disease. Some inquiries were held to investigate how patients escaped. And much like the social media of our time, Theories abounded about infectious diseases generally. One example comes from the Women's Hospital in Melbourne and lends a 19th century context to these critiques. In 1897, members of the hospital's female board of management, or at least some members, were convinced that gynaecological cancer was contagious. One, demanded an immediate stop to cancer admissions on the basis that, and I quote, the very thought of cancer being treated in the hospital was detrimental to the health of the other patients, end quote. Fear was indeed a powerful motivator in disease responses. In Hobart, patients and families were grateful to nurses for their diligence publishing their thanks in newspapers. Even so, nurses and their arrangements had critics. Early in 1887, a newspaper in Tasmania's north, for example, declared Hobart's staffing levels to be nothing more 
than wanton extravagance. Others wrote complaining about the care they was provide, that they were provided. But in May 1887, a former typhoid patient now recovered, Mr Thomas Willison, wrote to a Hobart newspaper defending the nurses and expressing his thanks. He could not praise the nurses highly enough. Who, their whole study appeared to be the comfort, happiness and ultimate recovery of patients. By, 1887, by August 1887, I beg your pardon, more than 30 nurses who had worked at the hospital that year had been affected by typhoid. At a function to award the medals to the 22 sisters and nurses in that month, the nurses were observed to appear jaded with impaired physiques. I read that as anemic and extremely thin. Several of the nurses were so ill that they spent weeks convalescing at a property donated by the governor's wife. One of the 22 nurses died in October 1887 from sequelae of typhoid, so her death is not recorded as related to typhoid. During the previous 18 months, five nurses in Tasmania's north had died, having contracted typhoid at Launceston Hospital. Even in these circumstances, there were quibbles about whether the Hobart nurses on convalescent leave should be paid while they were sick. Hobart's Mercury newspaper had recognised that good nursing by trained nurses was the chief requirement for recovery, recovery in typhoid cases because medicine could do little for them. But it came with a caveat. Employing trained nurses was beyond the reach of ordinary people. They were too expensive, the paper deemed. In truth, the cost of providing good nursing at Hobart Hospital in financial and human terms was high. The people who experienced good nursing valued it. The people who didn't have to experience good nursing were happy to critique it. But nurses paid the ultimate price, some with their lives. Back on mainland Australia, some hospitals like the Alfred in Melbourne, preferred to isolate typhoid patients, housing them in canvas tents within the hospital grounds. Karen Dawes argues that tents were favoured because they were cheap and easy to construct. They did not require ceilings or floors and walls of plaster, and they could be destroyed after use. For nurses, it has to be said, tents were not convenient workplaces. An 1891 Royal Commission into Victoria's charitable institutions heard evidence from a pupil nurse enrolled at the Alfred Hospital. She complained she became seriously ill while working in the typhoid tents. This pupil had 48 patients to care for in six typhoid tents. Inside the tents, the ground was covered with coconut matting. Daily, the nurse had to lift the matting and sweep it, in addition to performing the usual nursing care. Water had to be carried in and tents leaked when it rained. Lacking proper drainage, human excreta made its way to the floor and outside the tents. And remember, the nurse is taking the floor out to sweep it. Outside, the excreta mixed with rainwater and Melbourne's fine mud soil. The result was noxious smells and a mess that stuck to surfaces and shoes. Worse still was that the nurses attending these 48 typhoid patients had to live in tents nearby for the duration so that they did not infect the rest of the staff. In these conditions, it's hard to see how nurses kept themselves as clean as sanitary science demanded, let alone perform the duties expected of them. Infectious disease nursing in the 1880s was indeed a risky job for nurses, 
just as COVID-19 is today. Demographers have argued that in the early 20th century, the health of Australians was improved with developments in public health, including sewerage infrastructure and supply of clean water, better diets and housing. Medicine, meanwhile, was developing a sophisticated understanding of infection's origins and its transmission. In this period too, the efforts of professional nursing organisations developed consistency in curricula of nurse and midwifery training schemes. Isolation became more, stream, more mainstream as special sites of quarantine were constructed for those afflicted with infectious diseases. The Coast Hospital at Little Bay in Sydney, for example, had an initial stint as a tented facility for smallpox in 1881 and 1882. Reopened in 1888 as a built fever hospital with a vast expanse, it catered for diphtheria, scarlet fever, tuberculosis, and cases of leprosy in discrete locations within the facility. Later, it catered for polio too. Again, as Karen Dawes reports, these structures were purpose-built. They were able to incorporate systems for organising practices that minimised infection. Fairfield Hospital in Melbourne, for example, had special quarters for nurses in which the bathrooms came first to the outside of the building. Here, nurses could decant their work clothing, bathe and leave their working dress in the bathroom because it was effectively a contaminated area. Many of the infectious diseases hospitals subsequently developed nurse training schemes themselves and in conjunction with nursing professional associations cooperated with larger hospitals to ensure that pupils obtained training in conditions other than infectious disease. At one stage in Victoria, a certificate in infectious diseases nursing was advanced as essential qualification for every hospital matron to hold. While measles, mumps and polio prevailed, the next major epidemic to affect change in practice was in 1915 when meningitis struck. Medical treatment was available, such as Flexner's serum. This was an intrathecal injection of antiserum developed by the American virologist, Dr. Simon Flexner, who later headed the Rockefeller Foundation. Flexner's serum was not made in Australia in 1915, and those treating meningitis had to wait for supplies to arrive by ship. Medicine could also relieve the pain of the severe headache of meningitis, but otherwise care depended on nurses and nursing, keeping the patient in a dark room, maintaining fluids and nourishment, assisting with ablutions and keeping spirits up. Strasser reports that the major shift in the early 1900s was the understanding of respiratory droplets as vectors of spread. This knowledge prompted a major change in the accoutrements of nurses and others, up till then worn only in operating rooms. It became usual garb to protect patients with meningitis and those attending them by wearing masks in such circumstances. Protective gowns for nurses and doctors were another addition. Even so, these new arrangements in dress did not protect everyone in the meningitis outbreak. There were many reports, or there are many reports, of nurses being admitted to hospital having left work nursing meningitis patients. Similar, similarly, I beg your pardon, the influenza epidemic of 1918-1919 tested Australia's health systems and those who worked in them. Again, nurses formed the bulk of the practical response. The provision of regular fluids, encouraging nourishing food and assisting with ablutions were the main activities. An antiseptic that had been identified was eucalyptus oil. It was one of the few treatments recommended in influenza cases. It was used either as an inhalation with or without creosote or swallowed slowly 
with sugar on bread. Historian Kirsty Harris reports that military nurses, having returned from active service, were experts at managing influenza and specifically uh, conducting barrier nursing. In this practice, patients' beds were physically distanced. Screens or curtains separated patients to limit exposure from coughing and talking. In this epidemic, again, shortages of staff created strains. At one hospital, the matron was said to be demented because she could not obtain trained staff. Having to rely on volunteers created more work and more responsibility for senior nurses. Volunteers, while aiming to help with the best of intentions, did not have the necessary foundational base, nor did they understand the intricacies of nursing the severely ill. The cost of this human of this pandemic, we know, was high. Some trained nurses who had served in the First World War survived that period of service only to die at home after nursing people with influenza. Civilian trained nurses and volunteer nurses without training died. Exactly how many died will never be known because of the spread of people who were doing nursing. In 1919, the then Minister of Public Health, John Fitzgerald MP, remarked on the sobering numbers of deaths in those serving in the influenza pandemic. He thought it brought home the nature of the, the perilous nature of the work. For Fitzgerald, pandemic work was silent and untrumpeted work. It was on a par with anything done in the war, he thought. Fitzgerald was so overcome by the industry of nurses caring for flu patients and ambulance drivers and others that he believed they deserved a medal. Since the 1870s, epidemics and infectious diseases outbreaks have brought a focus to the importance of nurses and their work, but only while the epidemic has lasted. In 1887, the public of Hobart thanked nurses by awarding typhoid medals. But once the emergency of an epidemic passed, the profile of nurses and their good care drifted from public gaze. It was expedient in many ways for governments, for owners and managers of hospitals to maintain the mystique of good nursing, ignoring nursing organisations' pleas for recognition of their work as a professional undertaking for organisations, that sort of recognition would only signal demand for better paying conditions. In all areas of practice, appropriate education has laid the foundation for good nursing. Some hospital administrators valued only basic literacy and numeracy in nurses. Some doctors rejected education of nurses entirely, preferring the good old fashioned nurse whose primary qualifications were an intelligent, and sympathetic interest in the welfare of her patients, rather than someone who was bothered about the mysteries of abstruse science or the intricacies of analysis. In the 1920s, one far-sighted doctor stood out from this vocal crowd for his advocacy for education in nursing. He was Sir James William Barrett, the benefactor of this lecture. With his focus firmly on national vitality and public health, Barrett believed that a tertiary education pathway for nurses was the ideal model to improve the health of all Australians. Having expressed this vision in the 1920s, it took another 60 years to be realised. In conclusion then, how are we to understand good nursing? Good nursing in epidemics was key to recovery at a time when medicine had little to offer, before widespread vaccination, before antiviral treatments and before antibiotics. Over time, what were fundamentals in the 1880s have been expanded appropriately, taking in new technologies of care, embracing new therapies, while retaining fundamentals from hand washing to correct wearing of protective clothing. 
This is the way of good nursing, constantly reviewing its fundamentals and in circumstances where novel diseases emerge, such as COVID-19, good nursing is still about applying the fundamentals. With this year's pandemic, nursing has again been thrust into the spotlight. Worldwide, nurses have been highly praised and rightly so. But as we all know, memories of epidemics and other emergencies are fleeting. It's likely that post COVID-19, it will be up to nurses to remind the public about what nursing is and why, they, why nurses do it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Madonna, for a fantastic presentation. Now we have some time for some questions. And while I'm waiting for those questions to come through, um, I thought I might just uh, let you know that there's been a publication out uh, from our colleagues at Royal Melbourne Hospital. It's led by Professor Kirsty Busing, uh, who is at the Doherty Institute and RMH. And it actually is um, describing the epidemiology of, of health worker infections at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Now, with that particular paper, you know, what we notice is this whole idea about um, ventilation. Uh, there's, there's commentary on um, some of the uh, themes that have come through in your talk and I'd like to understand a little bit more about that particularly as it relates to sanitary science and miasmas what are the messages that we need to take from those old practices of sanitation science forward for nursing hmm. I think sometimes we 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 imagine that the way the old ways of doing things are just too old-fashioned to be relevant hmm. um but um in fact, sanitary science has a lot going for it and a lot of the practices that were undertaken, especially keeping surfaces clean and ourselves clean, while they were done for moralising reasons in the past, we certainly have a, can appreciate that they have a, a value now that's worth taking up. I, I think the, the idea, of, as I understand it, that paper that's just out is about um, care in hospitals and tied up with possibly mm. air conditioning. And of course, sanitary science was in vogue at a time when, when air conditioning was not available. But every technology requires review. I think that, that's the lesson from what, mm. what, one of the lessons we can take from epidemic history. Sometimes old ways are new again. Sometimes they're really quite crazy, like anti-typhoid tobacco. But some of them have resonance. And I was really taken with the similarities between Francis Gillam Holden's uh, recommendations mm -hmm. for home care and the ones that the Department of Health in Victoria recommend. Yes, yeah, so not a lot has changed, really. <laughs> Maybe in some ways. Yeah, well, I think, I think that's why history has a lot of benefit, because we can see sometimes we, you don't have to reinvent the wheel to do things well even though there are new therapies and new ways of practicing. Sometimes there are very good lessons from how people have practiced in the past with less technology. Right, yes. Well, we've got a few questions coming through now, Madonna. So I'll start mm -hmm. with uh, Lorella McCarthy, who's um, asking about um, the specialty of infectious diseases nursing. And how were women um, who undertook this role chosen uh, to, you know, participate in that? When did infectious diseases nursing emerge as a specialty and who undertook it? Um, look, thank you, Luella, for your question. Um, I think that's really difficult to know because um, it really started as a, as a, almost a, what, what, for want of a better word, postgraduate branch of general nursing. Um, but in fact, one of the women who trained at the women's in 1881, who came from Jersey, the island of Jersey in Great Britain. Uh, so she had, she had a, um, a certificate as a monthly nurse and a sick nurse. And she then took a job as the first matron of the smallpox hospital in Sydney. Um, so she had been trained in sick nursing, but yes. she only did that for several months and then went about working in lots of other places. The Coast Hospital is probably the first 
to start and they needed staff so they had to offer some sort of training. Uh, and um, places like Fairfield, I mean, it could, you know, it was difficult to attract people to those to that work mm. because, you know, smallpox was so feared, all those diarrheal diseases were feared and, and Fairfield was placed, like all of those places, way out where we weren't, didn't have anything to do with them. So um, without studying the background of all of those women, it's really difficult to say where they came from. Mm. But what Fairfield did in response was to create, with the Melbourne Hospital and the Women's Hospital, a combined training so that they did the bulk of their training at the Fairfield Hospital and then spent time at the Women's and the Melbourne to get experience that would then allow them to work in other places. Sure. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Now, Judith Goddard has a question here as well. She says, thank you, Madonna, for a wonderful wide ranging lecture, which gets to the heart of the matter. <laughs> How do you suggest that nurses um, best inform the public about the importance of their role? What a great question. Oh, thanks, Judith. Um, I think it's really tough because um, let's face it, nurses aren't great at um, patting themselves on the back. They go to work as professional people. They certainly don't expect to die at work. They expect to be paid well like other professionals um, and respected. But somehow we still, nurses still have to uh, do self-promotion either through our professional colleges, through rel related unions um, and through universities. I think it's interesting when you look at the coverage of COVID-19, for example, and people making all sorts of, sorts of commentary about it, uh, it's interesting that um, the media tend to go to the Australian Medical Association, which after all is a medical union. And, you know, maybe um, we have to reach out more. We have to make ourselves heard instead of being um, retiring wallflowers, mm. just going to work and doing the work. Yeah, and I guess the other thing is, you know, going back to that publication by the colleagues at Royal Melbourne, while it's a multidisciplinary piece, it does tell a story of nursing in the pandemic. So publications, something perhaps evidence-based practice is becoming more um, the, an, a normal thing for nurses to learn, whereas back in uh, earlier days, perhaps nurses didn't have an opportunity to participate in research, even though, as we know, Florence Nightingale was, in fact, a uh, very, very good at epidemiology and, yes, and a very capturing fine data. Statistician. Yes, mm. yes. I think I think nurses work too hard to be having time to worry about some things. But you know, there's a lot of women that we um, don't uh, ha don't know about, haven't promoted, who come um, become apparent if you study nursing biography. For, for example, a couple of the people who are involved with the James Barrett effort to install universe, education at the University of Melbourne, some of them were so well educated and they paid for it themselves. But when they approached health departments and uh, universities and senior doctors, they were dismissed. They were, they, their knowledge was not taken um, seriously, which is a great indictment, but... Um, it's time we resurrected some of those stories and told them. Fantastic. Um, we've got probably time for one more question. And, and this question comes from Faye Woodhouse, Madonna, and she says, thank you for your wonderful presentation. In one of your later images, there was a group of people outdoors. Um, and she's asking the question, was there any connection between health and the plain air movement in Victoria? Faye, I'm not sure which, hello, Faye, uh, I'm not sure which picture you mean, but um, the plain air movement is something I'm not um, so familiar with. But certainly if you look um, at, and next time you go around some, your local state or territory and look at old hospitals, usually modern hospitals are constructed around the old ones. And especially if you go uh, early in the morning, and find an engineer, they'll always show you around to see how these places were constructed and used. Um, and most of them had very big verandas. In fact, in Melbourne, there's a fabulous infirmary at the Abbots Abbotsford Convent, which is, mm. is an example of an old style hospital where the French doors open onto the um, 
veranda. Certainly for tuberculosis, fresh air and sea bathing in salt water was um, mm. very prominent in Britain and Scandinavia. Possibly less so here because of the heat. But Faye, that's a really good question and one I will have to take up. Thank you. Well, on that note, Madonna, <laughs> it's time to wrap up. Thank you for an absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, it's very inspiring to hear about um, the work that you do and the um, the nature of your presentations with all the images is, is very um, inspiring. It's also fantastic to hear about those lessons from history and look now to the future. Um, and uh, in particular, even though we haven't got a long history at the University of Melbourne, of course, next year, 2021, is going to be, uh, we are going to be celebrating 25 years of nursing at the University of Melbourne. Um, and so I want to let our audience know that in fact, um, we will be having some uh, further events uh, once the pandemic is uh under control and things are looking positive. But uh, later on this year, we'll start making some plans for what we can do in 2021, be that in person or be that via webinar and remotely. Um, I also wanted to draw people's attention to your publication, Madonna, the publication um, that was published in September uh, about eliminating the drudge work of nursing and campaigning for university-based nursing education in Australia. That is available online for people to read and we'll certainly send out um, materials so that people can reach that publication. And uh, I think it's an absolutely fantastic um, documentation of the work of uh, Sir James Barrett and indeed um, the benefactor who supported this lecture and so it's very uh, timely for this publication to come out um, as well and finally just wanted to let people know that we will be in touch with you uh, the recording will be available and downloadable from our website and we will also be in contact to get you to or to invite you to complete a, an evaluation of this presentation. So without further ado, Madonna, thank you so much. Um, Professor Alison McKendrick, everybody who's been part of this um, event tonight, um, our colleagues, students, alumni, uh, members of the Barrett family, thank you so much um, and good night.